The undead have always been beings within our world, within mythology, legends, stories passed down through generations. Most notable of these would be the prophecy of the Bible, depicting what the end of days to the society we have worked so hard to build and maintain might look like. Perhaps this quote from the Bible was to be the origin of the term undead, in which it reads, And, and this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the peoples that wage war against Jerusalem. Their flesh will rot while they are standing still on their feet. Their eyes will rot in their sockets and their tongues will rot in their mouths. The tales of the undead rising up and tearing down our world have even risen throughout the media over the generations, inspiring such work from George A. Romero with his B-movie franchise, giving several depictions of what it would be like to live within these scary and dark times in which over and over again the term zombie has always been seen to spark fascination within the readers, viewers and now players of popular franchises. However, what if there were some who would take these conceptions and push the envelope a bit further, transcending into the deep, dark, cold vacuum of space? in which something had been left, hidden and out of reach, out of sight, only to be rediscovered, much to the unfortunate soul's horror and displeasure. This is where we move past the typical version of the undead and to something far more disturbing in the world of dead space. Instead of dark magic or a simple virus spreading through the lands, defiling anything it touches, an artifact as many would call it, only known to humanity as the marker, an object that produces near unlimited electromagnetic energy, would begin the end of days for humankind, especially when many would attempt to use such an object or device for their own ends. The signal that the marker sends out would begin to subdue the people nearby through mental torture, giving them a series of nightmares that would lead into insomnia and shortly to depression, in which many would harm themselves, whether those be fatal or minor injuries. However, when the signal comes into contact with a dead body, the signal will latch onto it, radiating the deceased cells, bringing them back into action, which will then twist and reshape the individual to assume a new purpose, that being something far more gruesome and deadly. In this video, we will be going through the necrology side of things within the various media residing in the twisted franchise of Dead Space, exploring their anatomy, purposes and other subjects that are relevant to them. The necromorphs are in a nutshell like a typical zombie, where they would bite an unfortunate soul to spread the infection to others. However, necromorphs do not use these tactics to progress the infestation. Rather, they will simply kill the person and once they have gone limp and there are no other life signs nearby, 
the necromorph will depart, looking for more victims, in which the marker signal will eventually find the host, beginning the transformation period, turning the body or bodies into various different forms, whether those are individual forms like the slasher, leaper, puker forms, etc., or the more gruesome forms, such as the brute forms, all the way to the blood moons. The conception of the term necromorph was inspired by the xenomorphs from the franchise Alien, a species that are very deadly that seem to have evolved to assume that purpose to kill and breed using other species to spread their own race, in which they would gain the traits or abilities the species possessed upon birthing from them. The aliens even bled acid which can be seen to have evolved over time to be a final defense against larger predators. The second to inspire the design concept was to be from The Thing, however what many believe the developers had done to inspire them further for the design choice of making the necromorphs look more relatable to the player, with that being looking at car crash photos along with seeing the victims mangled corpses on scene and location. However, in the book The Art of Dead Space, it states that the rumor isn't exactly what inspired the twisted variations of necromorphs. It turns out that those were just myths of development, not the whole truth. However, what is the truth is indeed very disturbing, with the tail of the dead goat being pulled apart with them twisting and rearranging the limbs, organs and other parts of the body for the game's main line of inspiration for the necromorphs. The term necromorph are of Greek origin with necro meaning death and morph meaning change to. Most notable of the series are the two different ways a necromorph can appear being through the two directions for the story, one being the first era of the story surrounding the first set of installments with the recombinant life form, an organism that would reconstruct the DNA of a dead host, changing and absorbing the matter, allowing for it to grow its biomass, and thus creating a necromorph. The newer lore surrounding the second and third eras of the story tell us that the marker's electromagnetic signal is what creates the necromorph tissue and twists the cells of an individual, which has left many to be confused on why there is a divide within the story, with the use of a subtle or soft retcon, not completely trashing the events themselves, but merely changing them to be in line with the new direction for the necromorphs. Unlike your typical zombie horde, the necromorphs do not go down with typical body blows or with head trauma. Instead, the only way to put these sadistic, reanimated corpses down is to cut all of their limbs off, whether those be arms, legs, tentacles, or even the head. And by even doing that, the remains are still animated, but are immobilized, lowering their threat level dramatically. This isn't exactly portrayed within gameplay due to the technological limit at the time, however it is made aware to the player throughout the various media and logs found in the games and character dialogue. So with the overview out of the way, let's dive down into the various forms of the Necromorph Horde, in which I will be covering all of them, including the recombinant life form, as to entertain the idea of the organism within the old lore. And no, there are not 65 different types of necromorphs out there. Anyone who claims otherwise are merely including different variations of the same type, or using concept art to build up the numbers for whatever purpose that may be, which was what had inspired me to make this video originally. However, it is not the sole reason now. 
but there are in fact 42 different types of necromorph forms in the various media surrounding the books, games, comics, and films. So, let's begin our journey into the twisted and demented world of the necromorphs. The recombinant life form, or microbioorganism as it is referred to in the backstory logs of Dead Space and the book Martyr, was an organism that would have been created from a set of instructions plastered all over the marker's skin. The symbols once decoded would be a code for DNA. Once followed through with the formula, a set of cells would begin to reproduce rapidly, much like how our cells are to reproduce, starting with one becoming two, two becoming four, four becoming eight, and so on so forth, until a pinkish organism was to emerge from the growth. However, as this cycle progresses, the process would slow before coming to a halt, lacking the required material to continue its growth. Once acquiring the specific vector that being dead flesh, it will absorb the tissues and cells into its very being. From there, it will absorb the nutrients that can be harvested to grow its own biomass. However, with what it does not consume, it will change into a new form, that being necromorph tissue with the host's spliced DNA. Now, this is my speculation of the process, but bear with me here. The organism would consume the flesh, much like how we would eat food or drink water or any other type of beverage. Once eaten, the food will travel down into our stomachs where it will be further digested from there. The nutrients, minerals and vitamins will be processed and anything that isn't absorbed by our organs will be turned into waste to be later disposed of. However, the organism will do all of this, but instead of turning the waste into fecal matter, it will in fact twist and pulp the remains into one of its own design, effectively taking, in this case, dead human tissue and transmuting it into necromorph tissues, which would eventually lead into a necromorph being born. However, that is just my thoughts on how the organism would transform a specimen into necromorph flesh or a necromorph form. After gaining enough biomass, the form will become its more adult form, taking on the appearance of the fleshy environment that being the corruption. Once that has been achieved, it will recover the lost abilities through its evolution, with the ability to reproduce rapidly in mere seconds, returning to the organism, which will lead it into becoming one of many elder forms. If not, then all of them, with some of them being the Leviathan, the Tentacles, the Spider form, the Slug form, the Hive mind, the Cysts, the nests, and even the guardians. The recombinant life form or the microbial life form could also be seen to be a pure necromorph form before it mixes with other species to create the human and alien necromorph forms, which brings us to the individual forms of necromorphs. The infector is the most common form to take shape 
at the beginning of a necromorph outbreak or infestation, first with the head of the deceased dislodging from the body and the rest of the body rearranging itself to assume the appearance of a bat, with the arms and legs twisting together to create that appearance. The skin on the underbelly will shift to the back of the form, creating a tough and rigid hide, with some of the bones turning into a rod-like appendage that will be used to funnel the contents of its massive bladder-like organ that would be a combination of all of the major organs of the host body. The hands and feet would also join together to create powerful claws that can hold a person at bay, allowing it to complete its task. The claws also allow the infector form access to alternate pathing, with the ability to climb walls with ease. The bladder-like organ holds a reproductive use with it storing a powerful necromorph bacterial fluid that is possibly the same bacteria we have in our guts, within our intestines, that would be funneled into the heads of the deceased host. From there, the bacteria will flush through the system, allowing for the reanimation process to begin that much faster than the marker signal can. However, in the grand scheme of things, it does have a downside to this, and that is, the only form that is able to be created through this process is a slasher form, or a twitcher. The relation between the bacteria and the marker would go something like this. The infector pumps the fluid into the body, in which the bacteria would attach itself to the dying cells, stopping the enzymes in their tracks. The bacteria would then converge with the flesh, which in turn allows the marker signal to begin the transformation period that much faster, with the bacteria corrupting the cells of the host, living or deceased. It should also be pointed out here that every necromorph type contains this type of necromorph bacteria or necrotized bacteria within them as well. However, we will come back to this at a later portion of the video when we talk about the feeders with their relation to the bacterial side of things. As stated before, slasher forms are created through the use of infectors. However, this too also makes them the most common in the lower stages of the outbreak. The slasher gets its name from its attack, in which it uses its blades that have protruded through the palms of the hands, that appear to be those akin to scythe blades. The necromorph will tend to slash at a target, thus granting them the name slasher. There are other changes to the anatomy of the individual as well, that being the lower jaw has either fallen off or has been pushed back. Other slasher forms may not have this feature, and will instead have their jaw widened, showing the world their collection of teeth, which aids it in the field of battle. The jaw could also be seen to be an incidental feature, perhaps being when the person had perished, the other necromorphs had torn it away or dislodged it in the attack. The necromorph will also have either little patches of hair remaining, or be completely bald. The stomach will also be seen to have been torn open, exposing the intestines and other internal organs. Most disturbing of all though, is another set of arms coming forth from the inner workings of the creature, alongside the organs, but appear to be those of a child's due to the short length of them. This would be used to grab enemies and hold them, perhaps holding smaller adversaries while the creature delivers the killing blow. The feet of the necromorph has also changed to allow for faster travel and the ability to traverse in areas that are not supported by gravity, whether that is authentic or artificial. Other variants of this type have their arms pinned to their sides from the shoulder down too, the elbow creating these childlike arms and hands, 
but will also make up for this by molding the muscles of the individual into appendages that on first glance would appear to be its arms too, with the blades coming out of them as well. The blades themselves are created from excess bone material found within the individual, which are so sharp they can tear open metal panels. The necromorph will also charge towards their adversaries if they are too far away, in which it will swipe its appendages left and right, which in turn could also be the origin to its name. Similar to the slasher, the spitter can be seen to attack with two limbs formed out of the muscles that would lay underneath the chest skin layer. The muscles now emerge from the shoulders of the creature, creating blades at the end that would be used to stab enemies to death, but can also be seen to slash at them too. The variant of the slasher also possessed a ranged attack that will allow it to issue out a deadly acidic spit to the unfortunate soul to encounter it, hence the name Spitter. The mouth of the creature appears to have been extended outwards to accommodate this new ability, with the surrounding muscles shifting to push the jaw outwards, further creating an appearance akin to a Venus fly trap, which, like the name suggests, would be used like a cannon to fire projectiles outward towards targets. The chest of the creature has also been torn open, exposing the absence of the muscles and of the ribcage, exposing the lungs, heart and other internal organs, perhaps used as a distraction. The arms of the individual also appear to have been the catalyst to this appearance. Whether this was just an injury prior to death or was a design choice from the marker is unknown whereas the slasher has mutated feet to allow it to run faster and more efficiently, along with leaping into the air for access, the spitter's feet appears to remain intact with no visible changes. The stalker is a necromorph that can be normally seen in a group and rarely alone. The group will enter the area using their surroundings to their advantage, hiding behind cover, peeking around the corner until they have located their target, in which they will charge towards them with a screech-like scream howling towards the unfortunate soul. If the creature manages to knock the person down, and should they be weak enough, the stalker will proceed to headbutt them, along with tearing off an arm or a leg. Then it will proceed to grab the other, dragging the person away as they bleed out. If they happen to be spotted before they charge in, they will relocate their position in an effort to get the jump on their next victim. The attacks are also not random but are coordinated, working as a team to continue the infestation. The appearance of the creature's head seems to have been grafted from several excess bone materials, creating a more durable skull along with a sharper attack strength. The appearance gives off a bird-like look and in combination of their posture gives them a rather raptor appearance, which many would believe these to be dogs prior to the marker signal reanimating them. However, I would have to say that to be incorrect as it would have to be an adult human-sized dog. The hands and feet have been transformed into powerful claws, allowing for faster and stealth-like travel, and the upper limbs being used for scratching and clawing, if the need for such excessive force is needed in the event of a stalker losing one of its legs in an attack. 
The rib cage of the individual also looks like it has been scooped out, with the internal organs missing and perhaps used to create more biomass elsewhere, but also seems to have been a design choice of the marker to lighten the load. The crawler forms are smaller individuals that have undergone a transformation into suicide bombers. These would be babies or infants. With the bodies unable to pose a significant threat to an adult, their bodies have been turned into a swollen sack that relates to the way a body decomposes, in which enzymes will break down cells and tissues, creating a set of gases that will make the body appear bloated. However, if one were to pierce the bloated areas, then the location could explode, either minorly or majorly. This is what causes the torso of the deceased infant to expand and swell upon getting close to a target. The skin of the affected area will begin to expand, tearing itself away, acting as a biological hand grenade, which will blast people away and can even cause the loss of limbs, much like a landmine. The arms and legs of the infant have been expanded and twisted to allow them to travel great distances very quickly, more so than a normal infant would. The head appears to have been twisted to face its back. However, I believe the arms and legs have assumed that role already, giving that look to others. Crawlers will tend to slip and roll using its momentum to correct itself, and they can even crawl on the walls, perhaps with the aid of mucus and blood seeping out of their palms so that it may be able to stick to other surfaces. The lurkers are similar to the crawlers, however they are more developed, taking the size of a human head or chinchilla. The appearance of the lurker forms are that of babies or dogs. The back of the individual has been torn open, with three noticeable tentacles emerging from within itself, in which they have been formed out of the muscle of the individual. The necromorph with the use of these can fire projectiles out of them with them being bone fragments, similar to shrapnel. The necromorph can also use the tentacles on its back to stab its targets to death and to trip them up, along with being able to traverse through an area on any surface it deems necessary, with the use of its underbelly tentacles helping it to move and cling to any surface. Primarily, the lurker will keep its distance, however, it will also attempt close combat when the opportunity arises. The Leaper Necromorph gets its name from its ability to scale walls and leap down at their targets, attempting to make their enemies lose their balance, or to attack the head of the individual with their powerful claws. The Leaper will also make use of its tail to deliver a powerful strike with the bone blade at the tip, appearing like a scorpion's tail, in which the tail is formed from the two legs of the person, twisting together, fusing into a single appendage, with the bones making up to the tip, creating that deadly weapon, which has been seen to dismember the heads of its victims clean off. The arms have been repurposed to support the body, allowing it to move over distances very quickly and granting the ability to leap by pulling itself back and propelling over surfaces like a slingshot. 
The spine has also been seen to be pushed out as well, with very little or no skin covering the vertebrae. In most cases, the skin looks to have been stretched to the point of being torn, exposing the layers of muscle underneath. The jaw has also been repurposed to fit a more snake-like quality with its jaw and fangs, being able to unhinge in which it will climb onto an unfortunate soul and hold their arms in place with their own and grip the person's head in their jaw-like fangs, ripping the head clean off of them for a more instant result. The necromorph will also screech at its victims upon noticing them, however some noticeable hisses can be heard as well, which can be seen to be an indication of it watching and waiting for the opportune moment to strike. The divider forms are taller and less durable than other necromorph types. However, it makes up for that with its ability to dismember itself, turning into smaller appendages that will scramble towards the nearby target for strength in numbers. The divider appears to have been stretched out, completely tearing the skin apart and leaving the layers of muscle exposed to the environment. In addition to that, the internal organs have been scooped out as well, perhaps to be repurposed to add to the biomass growing on the walls. The necromorph will also make noises that are similar to whale calls that can be heard from great distances along with a distorted sound when it notices its next prey, in which it will use the momentum from its overly stretched out form to swing its claws at the victim them, tearing them apart, along with a medium range attack that it can use to pull a victim in closer with the use of a tentacle which it will lunge at the individual and will either pull them in or use to kill the person quicker, tearing through their neck, arm or leg like a thin wire. The individual pieces will also leap out at the person attempting blunt force trauma However, the main threat would be the head, which will attempt to wrap its tentacle tendons around the person's neck, ripping through their tissues, muscle and bone. If successful, the necromorph will assume command of the body by replacing the head. The necromorph will then assume the role of a later entry, the Shambler, which does the exact same thing as a divider head. However, they also possess more intelligence in the field of using human weapons or tools to subdue their enemies. This is where headshots will be a lot more useful than dismemberments. Similar to a crawler, the exploders act more as suicide bombers rather than a more persistent threat like stalkers, leapers or lurkers do. The exploders main attack is to move towards a target and once in close range, it will lift its swollen appendage into the air and slam it into the ground, which tears the swollen skin to the point of it exploding, which will cause a great deal of harm to its victims. However, it also has another attack if the explosive sack of bacteria and gases was to be torn off the arm then it will revert to a weaker but significant lunge attack using its head as a weapon. The exploder's appearance looks similar to something out of the thing, which can be seen to be something that's happened to the person before they died. The right arm has been elongated to the point of bones, muscle and skin tearing and the hand has been stretched out to provide balance where it will use this limb like a crutch. The legs have been fused together to add to that balance, 
However, the left arm has only the bone attached to the shoulder, with the rest of the flesh feeding into the massive, swollen hand to further add to the potency of the attack. The creature will also have the ability to issue out sounds that act like lures, as this necromorph's mobility has been dampened due to its purpose and fragile state. The sounds can vary in sightings, however the creepiest and most disturbing of all would be the ability to cry out for help. Similar to an infector's appearance, with it resembling a bat, the most notable difference, however, would be the remains of a human skull. This is a type of necromorph that can only be seen on a rare occasion, being present only in the early period of an outbreak, perhaps becoming more biomass as the infection progresses. The necromorph will swoop down and attack individuals with its own momentum. Another difference would be the remains of the lower spinal cord, with it acting as a tail perhaps for balancing issues. The Grabber Necromorph will be a non-mobile type, much like the Guardians, and is more of an internal type of Necromorph, with it appearing to be a normal corpse laying around, waiting for an unsuspecting prey to come towards it, to inspect the body, or to search it, in which the Necromorph will burst out of the neck, grabbing the person with the remains of the jaw-like claw, with the lower jaw split in half. A variant of this necromorph can be spotted in Dead Space Aftermath, however it appears like a weeping angel, covering its face with its hands, but this one is more of a offensive type, in which it will spray acidic liquid onto someone in quick succession after being discovered. Going back to the name, the necromorph will grab an individual, either killing them through strangulation, or by snapping the neck of the person, or by ripping through their flesh with a powerful bite. The Guardian forms, much like the Grabber, Cyst, and Nest forms, are sessile necromorphs, which have been fused to the corruption, acting as a perimeter defense unit, in which, upon being discovered, will unleash its reproductive capabilities at the people foolish enough to engage it. Fighting it at a distance, the Guardian will whip out its many tentacles latching onto the surrounding environment, perhaps in an effort to use for combat, or to pull nearby enemies closer so that it may deliver the final blow with its inner bladed tentacle, which, like a leaper's tail, will instantly dismember an individual but can only be done at a close range. The tentacles are most likely to be muscles or intestines repurposed. The Guardian will often give out noises that sound like a wailing human, to be used as lures or to make them more relatable to their enemies, so that they will be much harder to defeat. The appearance seems to indicate that the corruption has completely absorbed the person's mass with only their head being visible, as the corruption turns their body into a giant tumour. The necromorph will also disperse pods through its lower orifice, which upon landing on a surface will awaken and sprout a tentacle out. This necromorph, like others, possesses an evolutionary process However, with its premature and mature stages, 
The guardian stage we talked about right now was the adult or mature form. So let's talk on the more disturbing form, the premature form. As the corpse is being encountered by the corruption, it will begin to absorb it, much like how the recombinant life form or microbial life would normally have done. However, this time it will hoist the body into a position adjacent to a wall. It will then begin the transformation period where the corruption and its bacterial properties will morph the two entities together. All the while, the host's consciousness would have already have faded away. However, in Dead Space, all necromorphs share a sort of hive mind like consciousness, in which to us will look like a person wailing in pain or fear when it's actually just a necromorph. For instance, imagine the concept of a soul. Once you die, you move past the physical realm and into a more spiritual one, which is your soul. If a necromorph infects and reconstructs your body and we hear it mutter out noises, does that mean that you are crying out for someone to help you? See, that is the scary part that these premature guardians that were only featured in Dead Space presents. That even if you have died, the corruption can resuscitate you and force you into that role after death. However, it could also be seen to play with the idea of that person becoming whole or entering a different life, immortal and glorious, a play on what unitology believed at the time. Even if the corruption were able to resuscitate your mind, bringing you back from death, what purpose would that serve to the corruption, if anything that could be damning for it, or could pose a significant threat? Although it's not unheard of in older horror films, like a guy hearing his friend calling out to him, sounding as if he is in agony, and then the camera slowly pans to his friend as we all share in the character's horror to find that his friend has undergone a transformation while still being conscious, much like how the Flood operate. On a personal level though, I believe those wails and cries are just another set of lures to pull others to this location, so that they might too be cut down and added to the biomass of the corruption, or reanimated into more horrific variants of necromorphs. To me, that sounds like a more likely case than someone who has been dead for quite a while, and the corruption has the ability to bring them back. Another reason I will grant you as to why the form wails and cries could be because the person is still alive, which again is very unlikely due to their appearance with the absence of the pelvic region and the legs are missing, along with the internal organs being scooped out for more biomass to add to the corruption, and the muscles becoming the tentacles that hang from the large opening in the chest. The skin has been peeled away and the loss of their eyes. This state isn't one that someone could live through, as they would be brain dead due to the loss of oxygen. So no, the body and the person are in fact dead with no consciousness. The sounds that sound like muttered and distorted words are just an echo, used to lure more victims to the necromorph's horrific and gruesome embrace. As spoken about prior, the necromorph pods are primarily fired out of guardians. However, on rare occasions, they can also be dispersed from the surrounding corruption as well. This probably has something to do with how much biomass the corruption has been fitted with, and the pods themselves could be the internal organs that have been scooped out of certain necromorph types, as the necromorphs and the markers make use of all parts of the body, even the reproductive organs all the way down to the last cell. Once the pod has landed on a stable surface, a tentacle will emerge, 
which will fire out bone fragment projectiles towards a target. If the person gets too close to the pod, it will explode, creating an audible gas-like noise, which is evident to the decaying state of each necromorph. The Weezer forms are the environmental terraformers of the Necromorph Horde, in which it will breathe in oxygen, only to transmute it into a deadly, toxic gas with the use of its own respiratory system. The appearance of the creature can be seen to closely resemble a hunched over human or person, with exterior lungs present on the back, which will expand and deflate like our own set of interior lungs. The arms and legs have been fused together from the knee to the elbow, which further restricts the creature from moving or attacking, instead relying on biological warfare. People who would breathe in the deadly toxic gases would start to have difficulty breathing, coughing up blood. The second symptom would be in their eyes, with them giving off a stinging pain and becoming bloodshot. The reason for their names can be seen to be the noises they give out, with their breathing restricted to a wheezing and coughing motion. Other parts of the body will have exposed muscle due to the skin being relocated to support the expanded back region. The swarmer forms are tiny necromorphs that mostly reside within pregnants and are rarely seen alone. Their appearance seems to suggest that they are by bacterial origin and not what some believe to be hands. They seem almost like pure necromorph forms, however these look more like pieces of internal organs spliced from the host species body. They could also be skin or parts of the intestines or reproductive organs, or perhaps even a mixture of necrotized blood and other cells to create these organisms. Upon encountering an enemy, they will all leap onto them, attempting to tear the person apart with their small mouths and feelers. The pregnant form's appearance looks to be similar to the slasher forms, except with the host's arms molding into stabbing appendages. The body including the head seems to have taken a less human resemblance, and the torso has become swollen, as to accommodate the necromorphs inside with those being formed in the transformation period. Perhaps these were once women who were pregnant at the time of being turned into necromorphs, becoming a pregnant necromorph form, and the dormant and developing infant would be turned into a lurker form or into the swarmer forms. Pregnants will often charge towards an enemy, making less noise, making more mumbles and grunts rather than roars or lures. However, if someone were foolish enough to shoot the torso, the pregnant would try to hold the opening back, only for the contents to spill forth and begin attacking the unsuspecting fools.
The puka form is probably one of the more disturbing necromorphs, with its appearance alone, with the host's legs twisting together but not all of the way there, and another leg being comprised of pure muscle and other biomass deriving from the chest. The cavity in the torso also looks like the bones had been melted away, leaving the swollen and bioinfused organs exposed to the environment. The stomach has been repurposed to allow a deadly acidic attack with the puker necromorph doing what the name suggests, puking acid up onto its enemies. However, it can also shoot globs of mucus that restricts movement like the necromorph version of stasis. The hands of this creature have also been restructured into vicious claws used to tear limb from limb. The puka will often make wet snarl-like noises due to the corrosion of flesh within the throat. The reason for the more potent acid attacks could be because of the enzymes breaking down the cells creating gases and when in combination with those gases can create a deadly acid attack. Another reason could be that when a living creature dies and the body is deprived of oxygen there will be a notable pH change to the cells over the following moments as the body begins to break down. The acid attack can melt through nearly any material, including organic matter. The pack are a group of necromorphs who are rarely seen alone, hence the name Pack. They are comprised of children, possibly from the ages of 6 and up to 15, given their height. The body of the necromorph appears to be mainly intact, with a few scrapes and slashes being visible. The changes to the anatomy are as follows. The fingers of the child have been extended outward with the bones piercing through the fingertips turning them into talons. The shoulder blades have extended outward with the shifting of muscles and tendons to fill the cavity, granting the pack more strength when exacting its terror onto its target. The pack, for what they are, are extremely strong with them being able to rip the arm off an adult in seconds. The most common behavior that the pack members will have when delivering this blow will be to jump onto the person attempting to claw out their eyes, and then it will bite into the person's shoulder, tearing it clean off. The pack will then slap the individual with its talon, further slicing through their skin. The pack are very strong necromorphs, even though that they were once small children. However, this does come with its fair share of downsides, with blunt force trauma being an effective way of defeating these necromorphs, as their bodies were still under development, and a child's body is more vulnerable to that type of damage. Using objects like boxes in combination with kinesis can be an effective way of dealing with these abominations. The pack are always noisy in contrast to many other necromorphs with them giving out a loud screech that sounds like a distorted child screaming. The tentacle form is a necromorph that appears from the corruption, with its origin being formed from dead bodies as well. However, there are some that will be linked to a larger entity that are pure form necromorphs. Upon locating a victim, it will either appear with an appendage designed to wrap around limbs and drag them down into the corrupted tunnels, or others that appear with a stumped end designed to pound enemies to bits, crushing them under its weight or mass. The tentacle is the only necromorph that doesn't make noises other than the friction of them sliding over surfaces or crashing into objects. Although once dealing with one of the two variants, you can hear a noticeable loud moan coming from the origin site. 
that being the corruption. However, more on that later when we begin talking about the bigger and more conjoined forms. The Twitcher forms are variant slasher forms with the ability to cover great distances, dodge attacks and kill targets all in mere seconds. This is due to the people that are killed and transformed having a stasis module built into their rigs with the stasis mixing into the transformation process which in turn reverses the effect of slowing matter down granting the necromorphs the terrifying abilities to move fast, real fast, in which they will use as a great advantage over their enemies, with one attack being so vicious, precise and fast, they are able to slice through someone in a second flat, causing the victim to not even be able to comprehend what just hit them. The victim would be made aware of their injuries, however, when the torso begins to wobble back and forth before falling completely off its hinges, making the strike the point of no return. The appearance being that of a sped up slasher looks rather the same except from it's a more bulkier form, with the injuries showing through the host body, with the brain being exposed with a large piece of their skull being removed. However, unlike a normal slasher, the feet will remain intact in their original form, much like Spitter's feet. The main difference except for their speed is the arms with them closely resembling a set of humans remaining untouched through the reanimation process, however the blades protruding from the palms of the hands appear to be larger in size, perhaps the reason for the arms remaining untouched yet bulkier could be seen to help support the weight of the blades. Twitches will often spurt out heavily distorted and garbled noises, which could be the same noises a normal slasher makes but heavily sped up, which would match its ability to move very fast, which does seem to indicate that the speed ability is uncontrollable to the necromorph and more akin to a passive ability. The nest forms are necromorphs that shoot projectiles outward towards targets in zero-g areas. The necromorph itself does this with its bulbous-like sacs shooting them from within its own biomass. However, the tentacle once it has done this will retreat back, allowing for an outer shell that seems to be a part of the corruption that seems nearly unpenetratable by standard weapons or tools. The small projectiles will also act as a necromorph type as well, seeming as it homes in on the target's location with the appearance of a tagpole with a bulb at the head and a long tail that is used to propel itself to the desired destination in which the bulb will explode on contact like a crawler. However, much like an exploder, the explosion will be caused by blunt force trauma. The cyst forms are extensions of the corruption, much like the guardian, it cannot move, instead is a defensive unit used for holding down a specific area by shooting out explosive projectiles 
that have bacterial properties inside of them. If someone or something were to move past these necromorph landmines, the cyst will shoot out the projectile that looks like a nest's projectile, minus the tail, and just has the bulb with a few tentacles sprouting from it. Perhaps the cysts are variants or the infant stages of a nest. However, the size of the cyst can range from one being the size of a human head all the way to being the size of a double-decker bus, with devastating results that act more like nests in Dead Space 3. The creeper form is described as a slug-like mass that consumes the biomass of other organisms, in this case human corpses, as this is a martyr exclusive necromorph, however is not the only one present which we will get to much later. The creature seems to possess the ability to grow its biomass with each corpse it consumes, with Altman noticing the remains of a human skull in its near transparent mass, which could be seen that it could lead into bigger and more terrifying concepts later down the line, like the hive mind, leviathan or the spider forms. As the outbreak progresses, necromorph types such as infectors will be no longer needed as so they will become biomass for the corruption instead, or used to form other types of necromorphs. This is where the swarm forms will come into play, which are a mixed variant of infectors and swarmers, in which they will appear to be like spiders. With their tiny appearance, their legs seem to be the remains of finger bones, which support their main body, being in the shape of a spider's body. They, much like the pack, can be deadly, and a real threat when in a group with their ability to not just infect dead bodies, but to transform hosts that are still living. If in this situation, the necromorphs will pry open the mouths of the deceased or living, forcing their way inside. However, it is currently unknown how they infect this way. However, if we look into another franchise, such as Starship Troopers in their second installment, a similar bug of design and purpose can be seen here, where they would take root within the skull, assuming command over the nervous system while feeding on the brain for sustenance. This is how they were able to control the affected to such a degree, using their mind, body and personality against the humans, against the Federation. So perhaps the swarm's form infects the nervous system, corrupting it, allowing the marker signal to transform it quicker, or a more bacterial and biological explanation is in order here, with the necrotic cells breaking down the tissues, bones and other organs with necrotic versions of them. Apart from the glowing eyes, the fodder type of necromorph will remain to look completely human until it has taken sufficient damage 
in which it will reveal its necrotic side in the form of the bones and muscles, which can be transformed into two different variations, one being a downed fodder transforming into a necromorph with a ranged attack, and the other, the spinal cord and other bones will rip their way out of the upper torso and move in to whip the target with the sharp bladed ends. These necromorphs will also sound slightly more human with its notable grunts, perhaps used as lures as well, as the main objective is to kill as many organisms as they can, so that convergence may begin and finalize, so it is logical to suggest these noises to be used to lure people to them as they search for more victims. These necromorphs are the only type to use melee weapons such as ice picks to attack first. The feeder necromorphs are the sole reason and representation as to why you do not, under any circumstances, consume the flesh of the necromorphs. This is due to the previous statement about the bacterial side to the necromorph outbreak, in which, if consumed, the bacteria will infect and consume the internal organs of those who were desperate enough to attempt such a heinous act. As the bacteria continues the transformation period starting in the stomach and intestines, the infected will feel a severe state of cramps and will begin to grow delusional in hearing the marker's array of influence that much stronger. And yes, the transformation is happening as the person is being broken down internally. As the person has no sustenance from the flesh they devoured, the body will go into a state of feeding on itself with the muscles and skin shrinking and the internal organs beginning to fail and shortly will fall out of the body altogether for more biomass. The necromorph will resemble a skeleton at the end of the transformation period. It should also be pointed out here that the necromorphs on Talvalantis all look the way they do due to the decaying state of the host's body, with the skin looking mummified, which gives them the distinct appearance with such colours of mossy greens or browns or bronze looks. The feeder will also sound much like a guinea pig, not resembling a human growl, roar or scream or even a screech which could be another lure, but then again, there are certain things in all of video games that cannot be explained with a logical conclusion with those being certain sound design choices. However, one could be that the body has shrunken to such a degree that the vocal cords have become rearranged and garbled, much like a mess of material giving off the sound of a guinea pig, or the vocal cords resemble those of a guinea pig's due to the damage of the host body. The feeder will act much like the pack does, being primarily seen in a group and are rarely seen alone. They appear to be scavengers, especially in the early stages of the transformation period, with some trying to eat their colleagues. The feeders can only be killed by a shot to the head, instead of dismemberment to the limbs, which again is similar to the pack. However, if a feeder would happen to latch onto a person, they will begin to climb onto their back, grabbing a hold of the head for leverage, pulling it back until the neck vertebrae eventually snaps and the flesh tears off, decapitating the unfortunate soul. The arms and legs are very thin and very twig-like with the hands being restructured to look similar to a stalker's, which will have the same purpose to claw away at the intended target, until the person is ripped apart completely. The head of the creature appears to be just a skull due to the mummification process. 
There is also one last thing that separates them from other necromorphs, which is their dislike for the light, which if exposed to for far too long, it will send them all into a fit of rage and aggression. Sounds also play a factor as well, which will alert them to a bystander's presence. The Medusa forms are floating bulbous sacs that contain limbs of their own, grown from biomass in which it will use to strike targets that either try to pass through an area or to ones that get too close. If the center bulb was to be destroyed, however, a group of projectiles would home in on the target, with those being the same as the projectiles the nests fire out. The main difference between the Medusa and Nest forms is the ability to become mobile along with the given shape and size of the creature. The regenerator forms have a few variants and possibly all have different ways in which they can form, whereas it's possible that the Ubermorph is a pure necromorph form created by the corruption in combination with the marker signal due to its very alien design. However, there is little information about the regenerators in the third installment, so I am going to primarily talk on the Hunter, as they all possess the same abilities and are overall the same entity in the series, just in different designs. So, let's go through it. The Hunter was originally a person who had been experimented on by Dr. Mercer, who tried to emulate what the Infector forms do to dead corpses. However, he would try it on a live test subject, in which he drilled an opening into the poor individual's skull and poured a sample of corruption into the opening, with it leaking through into the brain cavity, in which the man would have undergone several seizures as the necromorph tissue began breaking him down through his nervous system. Now, the corruption has the ability to reproduce and grow very fast, faster than our own cell regeneration. Once the transformation was complete, the necromorph took on these growth abilities, meaning that the creature was able to restore lost limbs in mere seconds. The hunter's body looks to be a slasher variant, except the arms have fused with the torso that almost looks like someone was holding themselves to it, giving off a bulkier form. The muscle from the back has shifted to the shoulders along with the skin from other parts of the body to create two extra limbs along with the arm fragments of bone that can be seen protruding forth giving a spiked appearance. Bones at the end of the arms can be seen producing sharp blades. These are perhaps the remains of the ribs, which would make sense due to the once person's arms fusing to where the rib cage would normally be. From the waist down, the hunter's pelvic region looks to be very skinny, nearly anorexic in nature, possibly another area stripped to add more mass to the shoulder, arms and torso in which the legs also look like skin was shredded and torn, possibly due to the height difference between the humans and necromorphs. The hunter's head looks to have lost its lower jaw, which could indicate that it was used for the arm blades as well. The hunter will use these blades to dissect people and can even be seen to taunt targets by sharpening its own blades right in front of them by rubbing them against each other. The hunter is a very vicious and gruesome necromorph type as it will, upon locating a weaker individual, pick them up by skewering them with its blades, in which one blade will be used to graphically slice through one arm, then the legs, 
until all is left is one arm, a torso and the person's head. They will then give a moment to pause before delivering the final blow, as if savoring the moment. The Regenerator Necromorphs all have this rather cruel hunting behavior in which it will stalk its victims until they tire and then it will go in for the kill. This Necromorph type is a cruel, twisted killing machine and can only be put down for good with great amounts of firepower that isn't in traditional weaponry, or at least handheld. The creature seems to be nearly indestructible, however in the first installment, you or Isaac does put it down with the use of the shuttle engines as it begins its test firing, disintegrating the necromorph before the regeneration can commence. If one was to find alternative ways of putting it down for good, they would have to take into consideration the regenerative abilities and work out a way to counter them. The Ubermorph variant is 95% the same except for its darker and thinner design. However, the eyes are the most notable difference in which they have led some to believe that it is a clear indication that these eyes are definite proof that the Ubermorph transforms into a hive mind, which I do not believe that is the case as it would not make sense as the Ubermorph can only be killed in a few ways and not with traditional weapons or tools, so the evolutionary tree wouldn't make sense that a near indestructible necromorph would be turned into something that can be easily taken down with nearly any weapon as Isaac had demonstrated in the events of chapter 12 Dead Space. But that is just my opinion, yes it bears a resemblance, however so do some of the other types of necromorphs, as some look similar to one another. I would even go so far as to say that the eyes are nothing more than an indication to suggest that this is a commander in the necromorph hordes, high ranking if you will, designed and created for that task, especially given that it just walks through the government sector unfazed while the rest charge into the slaughter. However, we will touch up upon this subject once again because Dead Space Mobile actually brings in something that is worth noting about. The corruption is a biological, organic mass that grows at a terrifying rate, with its being able to grow very fast as many have said in the world of Dead Space that it regenerates faster than it can be cut down. Especially in the comics where Newman burns a tiny piece away only for it to return the next day with a vengeance. As the outbreak or infestation progresses, it will become the largest necromorph entity. Primarily, it is a terraformer, containing several shocking abilities that will change the atmosphere and can even form into different forms of necromorph that we will get into later, but for now the corruption is able to use different organs to change the atmosphere. For example, a human pair of lungs will be repurposed to breathe in oxygen that will be changed into a lesser toxic gas, similar to the wheezes. The stomach, liver and bladder will be used in combination to produce more of its biological matter that will be ejected out of the walls to further spread itself. The corruption can even begin to corrupt living organisms, consuming them, aiding in the necromorphing process, allowing the marker signal the ability to reanimate them that much faster. As the tissues and muscles become necrotized, as seen in Dead Space Salvage, the corruption is mainly a habitat changer that will change the surrounding environment into a necromorph friendly one, allowing the several forms ease of access to new areas that were deemed inaccessible prior. The corruption in short terms of exposure is mainly harmless, aside from being hard to traverse over with many needing to watch their step while walking on the organic ground. The corruption has been said to be a pure necromorph form, 
needing no host to spread. Upon observing the corruption, you will be able to see it pulsating, like it has a cardiovascular system. However, I do not believe blood is being pumped through those veins, but rather more necrotized cells and other fluids necessary to the corruption would instead be circulating around. Perhaps the nutrients and minerals it absorbs from its victims. So now that we have gone through all of the individual types of necromorph, let us go through the more gruesome and deadly necromorph types in which are formed from either multiple corpses or the corruption itself. The brute form is a rather large necromorph consisting of several corpses with limbs sticking out of the sides and back of the creature from the host's bodies. Some bone matter has been shifted to the forearms, fists and shoulder blades of this form. The creature's head consists of a single human head. However, there are alien variants of this form, being a more stretched out version, rather than being comprised of many corpses. The human spliced version will let out a roar that sounds like a whale or other sea creature, and its main behaviour is to pound its enemies to bits. The bone plating is near impenetrable to standard military weapons, including the pulse rifle that was designed to shatter bones with its kinetic rounds. The reason for this could be when a creature or human dies, the muscles and tendons become more rigid and less flexible, and in combination with the necrotized bacteria creates a hard shell-like armor. The brute has two weak spots from the front, with the gap in between the armour showing more flesh. A little note should be made here that the yellowish spots are a gameplay mechanic and design, not indicative of the lore of these creatures. The yellow spots on all necromorphs are to indicate to the player a weakness, which should be fired upon for more devastating results, like many bosses from this era do. In the case when their way to defeat a necromorph is not made clear for the ones that aren't bosses, like the nests, otherwise more necromorphs would possess yellow spots all over their limbs. I think everyone is up to speed on what bosses from this era will do in their attack cycles where they throw a few attacks and give you an opportunity to strike at their weak spot, much like the behaviour of the hive mind and leviathan forms. The alternative way to defeat a brute is to shoot it in the back. As the brute cannot be as mobile as it once was, it will begin to use alternative tactics to defeat its enemies by launching balls of flesh that will explode on contact. If the brute was to grab a person, it will proceed to pull them into its large maw, where similar to a certain fish, an inner jaw resides, which will clamp down on the individual, breaking bones, severing flesh and tissues before ripping the person out, showing the extent of the damage. It will then rip the individual in half with its sheer strength. The posture of the brute looks to resemble a gorilla, and is one of the many that does not resemble a human. The alien variants resemble their species more in-depthly, which will act in the same manner. However, will not involve ripping targets apart, instead it will use its claws to tear away at an enemy. They can also spawn crawlers in their alien counterparts that will be used either as distractions or strength in numbers if the situation deems that tactic to be necessary. The human spliced brute form will also huddle up into a ball to further protect itself before continuing the onslaught if enough damage has been received. However, the opening to the weaker flesh remains present but just barely as the bone plates shift towards each other, creating a greater defense against strong attacks.
The tripod form is another necromorph that has fused with many corpses, where the skeletons will make up the parts of the arms, making them vulnerable to attacks. The tail and body is made up of the muscle, internal organs and skin of the individuals. If a target is too far away for its melee attack, it will make up the difference with its powerful leaping motion, in which it can cover great distances in outdoor areas and large indoor areas. However, they are most commonly found outside due to the corridor's limitations. The tripod also has another attack with a spear-like appendage, in which it will use it to stab into targets and even dismember them. The form can also grab individuals with its tail to drag them away much like the tentacles do, or to pull them into a closer position, readying them for the final strike with its bladed appendage that emerges from its mouth. This form is most commonly known as the Tripod Leaper for its leaping abilities. The tripod will also be seen to gravitate towards the ceiling of a large open space in which it will drop down ambushing individuals for more effective strikes. The Leviathan is a massive pure necromorph form that has been formed by the corruption and isn't a mobile form. Instead, it will allow the corruption to continue feeding it more and more biomass to increase its size. The Leviathan also appears to have growths appearing out of it, as well as tentacle ports that will regenerate themselves once the tentacles have been dealt with. The Leviathan will then open its maw to shoot fleshy projectiles out towards an individual foolish enough to engage with it, that will explode on contact. However, in doing so, will show its core weak spot, in which, if enough damage is received to it, it will give out a large explosion, ceasing all activity within the creature. This creature would normally appear in the middle part of an infestation or outbreak, and gives out the same noises as large sea creatures do. There is a misconception about the Leviathan colliding with the USG Ishimura, in which it creeps inside and begins to barricade itself in the food storage chambers. However, the log that alludes to this is merely speculating the crash she would have heard would have been the Leviathan, when in reality it was the shuttle crash into the side of the Ishimura, not the Leviathan, as there was no biomass floating around in space to even suggest that that idea was to be true, but that is another topic for another day. The urchin form is a massive necromorph form that has been created by dead bodies and biological waste, that being urine and fecal matter due to its rather dark green appearance, and the fact that it has been formed in the sewers of the Ishimura. The form has a main body at the center and several tentacles that emerge from its submerged sides, in which the rest of the creature's appearance is unknown, but perhaps would have resembled a human-like squid or octopus due to the aquatic environment. The creature would have most likely of used its tentacles to grab victims, either tearing them apart or crushing them to death like an anaconda. The sounds the creature makes is similar to the Leviathan's, however, there isn't much else to go on here due to its rather brief boss battle in Extraction. However, due to its large mass, I would have to say that this is another mid-game or late-game necromorph form.
The Snow Beast Necromorph is widely speculated to be a pure necromorph form. However, without clarification of what all the creatures on Tal Volantis appeared as before the change, I cannot say for certainty that it indeed is. However, from its appearance alone, it does appear to be a crab or spider form. The form itself has four legs, in which it will use to ram into targets over and over again. Similar to a spider, it has a bulbed head at the center, and another bulb behind the center, in which three tentacles will emerge from its back, much like the lurkers do. Interestingly enough, the snow beast also possessed a tongue that it will use to lap at its prey. The legs of the creature look as if they were formed to traverse difficult and different terrains. Whether the formation was prior to the planet's change or not is unknown. The snow beast form is also able to regenerate its lost tentacles as they retract back inside the body, which means it could have been formed from the corruption itself. Three times the size of a brute form, the Tormentor is a wide collection of corpses all stuck together, creating a single entity. The two sets of arms look to be bone-plated, with the claws at the end of them being comprised of human legs and arms. The Tormentor also has an elongated neck with a human head at the end of it. Under the head appears to be the maw of the creature, in which the lower jaw has been sliced in half to create pincer-like appendages. The Tormentor in combat will use its claws to grab individuals and then it will either use its great strength to bash them against other surfaces like a child having a tantrum or will pull them closer to bite their head off. Similar to the Brute, there are noticeable weak spots near to the shoulders. The form has four legs and two arms. Due to Isaac's brief encounter, there isn't much else to go off of here. However, it is clear that this large monstrosity is not a pure necromorph form. The slug form is another massive necromorph comprised of pure necromorph tissues and necrotized flesh. The creature upon being disturbed will sprout out several tentacles much like a lurker does, in which it will use to throw objects at the target or will use them to crush and tear its enemies apart. The spider form is another massive necromorph that is a pure form, however most of it is not visible in the events of Dead Space Extraction. However, what is visible shows us bone plating and resemblance to arachnids. The spider form has many legs for which it uses to support its mass. The main features are the two arms and tentacles in which it will use to crush and bat its targets away. The form also has a tentacle lurking within its maw that will seek out a target and envelops them, in which explosive bacteria sacs will appear to hurt its victims or to at least impair them. The Moor also possesses another attack that will emerge from the opening, that being another appendage that will form out explosions on contact with the target. Most concerning of all though is what it can do at a long range, with it being able to launch a necrotized bone spear at a victim, which if it does not kill them, will infect them 
with the necrotized bacteria flooding into their bloodstream. It is possible that this spider may become the slug form, but it hasn't been confirmed and can be easily debunked by the appearances alone. However, perhaps after the fight with Nathan McNeil, it sustained enough damage and became part of the Leviathan or corruption. The split face form is another matter exclusive necromorph. Whether it's a pure necromorph or not is up for debate, as there aren't any visible indications, rather more descriptive ones. The creature consists of having two heads, seven blade-like legs, a yellow and black pustule-like tumour on its underbelly, with a body comprised of human torsos. However, once disturbed, another head will form and spike bone material will form out as a defensive or with a creative mind offensive capability. The creature appears to be a mix between a divider with the ability to launch its head after prey, spikes that form out of the body like the tentacles of a lurker, and a crawler with with the explosive sack on the underside of the creature. Before we get into the hive mind's analysis, I would like to point out something that connects to the ubermorph, for another reason as to why those variants of the regenerator have those specific eyes. As Carrie Norton gets close to the core, she will see a massive creature who has wrapped itself around the core of the government sector, which makes out sounds akin to the hive mind, which has led many to believe that the creature is a sort of proto hive mind. However, in the introduction to the creature, we can see a human shaped organism connected to the beast. Now, if the proto hive mind was to have these specific growths all over the body, then it wouldn't give me cause for concern. However, this seems to be the only place of the body that looks like this, which looks to be something out of the alien franchise, which seems to indicate that the hive mind can create regenerator forms from within its own being, which if that were to be the case would explain the likeness between the two forms. However, you could tell me which you think is more likely in the comments section. Moving on, the hive mind is one of the biggest pure form necromorphs, consisting of the corruption turning into a worm-like necromorph with multiple tentacles all varying in size, with many large tendrils growing from its back. The form also has five distinct eyes that circle around its maw that are to be in a pentagon formation. Inside the creature's ribcage, that are muscles, not bones, with them being able to open open up and flex very easily. Inside the cavity will lay out its vital organs with an extent of them being within the creature. The hive mind will make noises that sound like a cross between a variety of different animals, perhaps sharing the same vocal cord formation of certain animals that give off this distinct mix of noises. The hive mind form will have a set of different behaviours when engaging targets which aren't limited to trapping individuals as well as groups, however most commonly the hive mind will attempt to pick up individuals throwing them into the maw, which looks to be similar to a Venus flytrap. Then it will use its powerful muscles to grind down and crush its prey before using its teeth like muscles to hold the person in place, before tugging at them with 
with its tentacle, which will result in the loss of their arms or potentially their head or legs. Then it will throw the person back into the throat, crunching down again and doing the same, ripping them out, which will tear the individual in half before releasing the person, allowing them to fall before giving out a loud scream, screech or roar to intimidate others. It should be noted here that the hive mind is a very powerful necromorph as it can even multitask when executing all of these attacks at once, allowing more destructive and devastating results to occur within an infestation or outbreak in which it should also be noted that the hive mind is a mid-game adversary however due to its mass would shift towards the beginning of the end game in other scenarios the hive mind will strike at its targets with its array of tentacles and crush them with its sheer weight in one instance the necromorph had crushed kendra and had dragged her body along the floor causing massive bleeding and threw her at the side of a nearby building perhaps to intimidate others, demoralizing them further when facing this abomination. The necromorph can also shoot balls of flesh that explode on contact as well from its back, like artillery. Many believe that the hive mind controls the necromorphs, which is actually incorrect. See, we will talk about this more later, but the hive mind merely communicates with lesser forms, perhaps influencing them, but not directly controlling them. The hive mind can also produce pregnant necromorphs which it will hail down with the same artillery like firing mechanism located in its back. The Nexus is similar to the hive mind form, however this is an alien version in which the differences are many with its design resembling an insect like creature, perhaps aquatic in nature or before the transformation begins. This necromorph will not enclose its prey but will instead attempt to crush it with its powerful and massive arms, however if that fails it will attempt to suck smaller creatures into its maw where it will begin to swallow them whole, sending them down into the stomach where they will be digested and broken down via the use of nests growing within the stomach. If that fails, the necromorph will spit out the incubation pods it produces that hold feeders inside. The creature will then rise above the target, revealing its heart or vital organ located within its chest cavity. Destroying this would perhaps kill the creature or leave it at a dormant-like state. Destroying the nests inside the stomach will act as indigestion, which forces the creature to release you, or in other words, regurgitate you back up. The Nexus will also exhibit sounds like a set of animals as well. The Nexus also has several defense mechanisms presented within its body, with the enhanced feeders being present, acting like the body's immune system, that being a more twisted version but one all the same, in which it will fight off intruders inside the chest cavity will also contain nerve clusters, which helps to ping to other necromorphs and the marker signal more effectively, acting as another commanding form. And finally, here we are, coming full circle with convergence as the marker has reached the desired death and reanimated toll, and enough biomass has been accumulated in the form of the necromorphs or corruption, it will use its gravity abilities to pull all of them up becoming one with the marker. As it does this, it will also pull up terrain, which will get pushed to the surface to act as a shell for the mass, creating a moon 
like appearance, which will protect it against the harshest of the dead space, or against retaliation from spacefaring species with the rocks and other structures, sponging up the damage. However, an opening can be seen to produce large tentacles and tendrils, with them waving around, perhaps to be used in pushing the moon through space, like an aquatic creature similar to how a shelled squid would have done in the prehistoric times. However, as I have mentioned before, the Blood Moon or Brethren Moon or Brother Moon, as they are referred to as, doesn't create markers, as they would not infect other species with a mental blueprint, which in turn causes dementia. They would instead focus on wiping them out, speeding up the process of an outbreak. Upon being born into this new form, the moon will instead use its tentacles to fling the surrounding markers into space, where they will travel until coming into contact with another species or planet or moon. Within the center of the moon, a final defense to the converging marker will be present, with another form that possesses three eyes, a large maw, on one other side of the creature's head that would lock in a target with its tentacles before pulling it into a dark and grisly embrace. Under the head also contains another maw that opens up as well. Most notable in the battle with the necromorph, Isaac managed to shred its insides in which we are able to see the guts of the creature with the intestines resembling humans, which is quite interesting indeed. Another ability the moons have are to communicate telepathically, not to just necromorphs, but to other species too, with them triggering the dormant dementia within Isaac and Carver, making them hallucinate their presence or awakening. The moons are also very cunning and manipulative creatures as well. They will be willing to do and say anything to get the end result that favours them. The Necromorphs in Dead Space 3 are distinctively different from their counterparts in the rest of the media due to their more mummified appearance. However, they are Necromorph variants in the third installment, like for example, the Leapers have multiple corpses attached to them to give out a stronger blow, most notable in the tail section, making them appear as a larger threat or to further make the necromorph more durable to the harsh environment on Tau Volantis, or perhaps both. While not being a different type of necromorph, it is still worth talking about the various variants of certain necromorph forms being enhanced in the transformation period. However, there is a reason I haven't talked about this in the necromorph analysis, and that is due to the enhanced versions not being a separate entity, in which other creators or YouTubers cannot seem to understand when talking about them. For example, 65 different types types of necromorph videos, in which they included every single enhanced necromorph as an individual type, when that is a complete fabrication, as the only differences between the standard and enhanced is the colour of their skin, the damage they both deal, and their overall durability, which does not warrant for those two variants to class as an individual type. So an enhanced leaper is still a leaper at the end of the day, and a enhanced slasher is just another slasher. With that brief explanation of why I haven't included enhanced necromorph forms in the main list, let's go through why the necromorphs may look the way they do after the transformation period, and why they can take more damage and why they deal more damage. 
Despite what some may tell you, there isn't actually a reason as to why enhanced necromorphs can deal more and take more damage, as it was just a design for gameplay to challenge the player further and has no real lore relevance. However, I will entertain the idea and attempt to give a credible answer to this by using a body decomposition study to suggest why the enhanced are able to do what they can. When a body is being transformed into a necromorph, whether that be with the marker signal or by an infector, it will still be dead, so the body will still decompose as a normal subject would. So after the necromorph is formed, it will be a darker shade of necromorph with very sharp attacks and more durable limbs. However, over time the blades will begin to dull and the body will continue the cycle of decomposition, rotting if you will. So the durability of the skin, muscle and bones will start to lose its complexion, its composure and become weaker, allowing for lesser weaponry to be more than sufficient to remove limbs. However, most notable is that after a certain period of time has passed since death, your body will change colour, turning into a marble colour after two days, which has been described to be a pale white colour. This is because when our bodies decay over time, gases will pass through the blood vessels which in turn gives off that colour. After six days of this cycle, the body will interestingly enough turn to a black colour. So perhaps the infection or bacteria from the infectors or the electromagnetic signal accelerates the decay factor, trimming the amount of time required for the skin to turn black. So there are two ways an enhanced necromorph becomes enhanced, but in video games there are always going to be certain things that cannot be explained, as stated by a developer in the art of the Dead Space book. So enhanced damage and durability could just be a gameplay design not indicative of something to do with the law. Ask yourself the question, when have you ever seen enhanced necromorphs outside of the games? The absence of the enhanced forms seems to indicate that these types were not meant to be taken as a different variation within the law, but just another challenge to be conquered in the gameplay, as facing off against the same level of necromorph could make the game very boring, but perhaps necrotized tissues, flesh and bones are just more durable than humans. So with all that out of the way, let's go through a timeline of decomposition to back up my explanations of how certain things like crawlers and enhanced necromorphs may occur after death. The first stage of decomposition in humans is called autolysis, which is also known as self-digestion, in which after the respiratory system ceases or blood circulation stops or both vital organs begin to shut down. After a few moments, due to the lack of oxygen, other things like the digestive system and removal of wastes will also stop functioning, in which carbon dioxide will spread through the blood vessels, which creates an acidic environment for the internal organs, which then causes the membranes in the cells to rupture, in which the membranes also release enzymes that consume the cells from the inside out. Each hour after death, the body's core temperature will drop until it reaches the same temperature as the environments. A stiffening of the muscles will then begin to settle in, in which small blisters of nutrients begin to appear on the organs and skin, and the skin's top layer will begin to loosen. The second stage is called the bloating stage, which is where the enzymes begin to leak out of the cells beginning to produce gases and the sulfur containing compounds release bacteria which causes skin discolorations with the body turning that cold white color which will progress to a pale green color then to purple 
and finally black. Over the course of decomposition, due to the gases circulating through the blood vessels, the human body can in fact double in size. The microorganisms and bacteria then begin to produce an unpleasant odour, which some who have come to know the smell will tell you that it is the smell of death, which is actually called putrefaction. This is where the third stage begins, with the active decay. Fluids will begin to appear from orifices which indicates the active decay, organs, muscles and skin become liquefied. When all of the body's soft tissue decomposes, hair, bones and cartilage, the corpse will lose the most mass during this stage. And finally, the last stage appears, skeletonization, which I don't think needs explaining. However, there is no set time for when this stage occurs. However, here is a more simplified timeline for a better understanding. After two seconds of inactivity with the heart and lungs, the body is deprived of vital oxygen and pH changes start to occur. After 10 seconds, the body temperature will start to drop every hour until the body's core temperature drops to room or environment temperature. Just so you know that your core temperature is actually 35 degrees Celsius, which for my American viewers, that is around about 98 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, I know, right? I was shocked when I found that out too. Guess Isaac's temperature counter in Dead Space 3 was working just fine. After 30 minutes, blood will begin to pull towards the side of the body that is closer to the ground, succumbing to gravity, which is also called liver mortis, Two hours into death, the muscles will become stiff, rigid and hard to move due to the loss of oxygen and blood flow. Seven hours after death, microbes will begin to break down carbohydrates, proteins and lipids. 12 hours after death, the enzymes will leak out of the membranes of cells, beginning to break them down along with the tissues. After one day, the skin and organs will begin to blister, causing noticeable bumps and blisters to loosen the first few layers of skin, which will be the main indication of decomposition at this time. After two days, the corpse will begin to bloat inside the abdomen, where various gases and bacteria are being produced, giving off a bloated appearance, which can issue out a minor explosion if the skin and muscles are penetrated. The skin will also begin to undergo a change to colour, turning into a more marble colour of white, which will then, after a certain period of time, develop into other colours. Four days after death, hair will begin to fall out, leaving the individual bold and the skin will easily slip off the body, exposing near to the muscle layer. Along with the nails sinking into the fingers, blood and other liquids will then begin to seep out of every orifice the individual has. Six days after death, the body discoloration ends, with the body turning into a darker hue. Eight days into decomposition, the tissues start to liquefy, turning into a soupy liquid. Ten days after death, the internal organs decompose in an orderly fashion. No, no, that's not a joke. That it's literally what happens. They literally do start from the top down, beginning with the brain all the way to the intestines, prostate or uterus. 17 days after death, the decomposition begins to slow down as most of the flesh has been stripped away from the skeleton. After 30 days, the tissues have been completely decomposed, leaving the bones exposed with bits and pieces of muscle only remaining. 32 days into decomposition, all of the byproducts of this process have completely dried up, leaving only a skeleton and some hair behind. As the cycle concludes, The necromorphs are indeed a force to be reckoned with, and are a very disturbing and twisted enemy in how they spread through the many species of the galaxy, or at least the remains of them. The necromorphs are not just your stereotypical zombie horde, but rather are very advanced compared to the zombies of Dead Rising or The Walking Dead. Stating that the necromorphs are just space zombies is an injustice to their very being, as even one necromorph has the potential to wipe out an entire city, something that a normal zombie could only dream of becoming. 
The Necromorphs are an extinction threat level that are designed to kill and wipe out other species. The Necromorphs all stand as a parody of humanity with our own dominance in our world against all other species that we assimilate into our society that we cage, keep as pets or breed only to be later cut down and turned into lumps of meat ready for purchase. Perhaps that is what animals view us as. That is why certain animals flee the area when approached, which is a very sad thought. However, unlike our society, the Necromorphs have mastered a society of unity, where there would be no murder, no crimes, no false allegations, a society of flesh and bone, where there is no real free will. Back to the lore, however, the Necromorphs all communicate with each other via a telepathic link with the marker, in which the link will travel through the smallest forms to the individual ones to the conjoined, to the massive behemoths, all the way to the marker and back to the source, the brethren moons. They all possess heightened senses that they use to seek out other victims or people that are in hiding or searching for them or are proceeding to an objective. The Necromorphs come into play as the Femi Paradox, in which people have theorized about the reason we may not find life out there in the cosmos is due to something either defeating them, killing them, or otherwise assimilating them, which is what the Necromorphs do with the plan the Markers and the Moons have for the universe. Perhaps there would be a quicker and more efficient way of defeating the Necromorphs and their Marker Masters. However, like Ben Wannett says, that he thinks the characters in the Dead Space universe would be sorry they did. Sometimes it's better dealing with the devil you know. Thank you for watching the retrospective exploring the necrology of Dead Space. If you enjoyed, then hit the like button. Comment your thoughts below and I look forward to hearing from you. Sign up to join the British Alliance today by subscribing and ringing in the notification bell today, allowing all updates from the channel to be notified of future content, whether those be videos, streams, community posts, and be sure to check out the new memberships on the channel as well by hitting the join button so you can see which membership style is for you and I will see all of you among the cosmos and be sure to have a good one.